Hello everyone, my name is Daniel Reese. This is Weaver Leather Supply. Today we've got one of my favorite topics for a theme for a project, and that is America, right? I'm thinking a Roper wallet, probably some red, white, and blue, some stars and bars. Distress it a little bit, that should work. So the template that we're gonna be using today is this four piece acrylic Roper wallet template from Weaver, and it's made by Maker's Leather Supply. Before we get into that, we got a couple of things to talk about. Okay, so first, this is a simple project that anybody can do, but there's a lot of steps to it, and they're pretty in-depth. That doesn't mean they're hard or complicated, it just means there's a lot of steps. So, in an effort to keep this video at a watchable length, what I'm going to do is I'm going to gloss over some of the more basic steps, especially if we've done a video on how to cover that specific step. So, in that scenario, I'll be referencing those videos and we'll make sure we put a link in the description to that video. And secondly, a few of y'all have mentioned that it would be nice to know how long a project took from beginning to end, just so you can get kind of a reference point of how long it should take, where you're at, that kind of thing. Obviously, it takes as long as it takes to get it right, but I'm gonna try to include that information in the videos going forward. I can't promise I'll get it in every one, but I'm gonna try to make sure it gets in there. With this particular project, because we tooled it, we painted it, and we assembled it, it was really in the four to six hour range, somewhere around in there. Now, I'm I'm filming while I'm doing this, so that adds a good bit of time to it. But, you know, I would say four to six hours is a pretty good time frame to do something like this, especially for your first time. If you've done them before, it's going to move faster than that. All right, so now the boring stuff's over, we can jump into the fun stuff. The first thing is just going to be cutting out the pieces of leather, and we're pretty easy to do this. We're going to lay our template down on top of our leather and cut out around it. We're going to do that for all four pieces. Now, something to mention, the slots right here, I'm going to show you in a second how to do that. It's super easy, but this square right here, you don't want to cut that out. Leave it. It even says up here, do not cut out. So this is used for something else. Something else is essentially a template. We're going to leave that. Now, as far as the prep steps go, I've already taken care of that as well. So I've taped the back. I've cased the leather. Casing the leather means that I'm going to get it wet to the point where it takes about one to two seconds for that water to soak in. I have traced the image onto my tracing paper. Then I've transferred it to the leather using a stylus, and I've stropped my blade. Now, if you need more information on any of those steps, we just did a video a couple of months ago. goes through everything in detail. We'll put a link to, the, to that video in the description. So cutting this one in is actually super simple. It's all straight lines. I just started with the outside border. Once I was done with that, I picked a side and started working across it line by line. Now, I did save the stars for later. I'm not working on it in this step. That's, I think, it's couple down. You can go ahead and do it now if you want to. I just decided to do it later. Then it's time to get out the bevel. Now, I know this is a lot of straight lines and it looks like a ton of beveling. I'm gonna show you a way to do it that makes it a lot easier. It, it involves a particular stamp. If you don't have that stamp, it's perfectly fine. You can still do this. You'll just use a traditional bevel or, or something to that effect. But first, let's get out our steep bevel and start working on that border all the way around.
From here, we need to do something with all those lines in the middle of the design. First thing that comes to mind is maybe we just grab a traditional bevel and we bevel all the lines on the same side, the same direction. Well, the problem with that is we're gonna end up with this shingled look, almost like siding on the side of a house. Um, so that's not really what we're going for. That's not gonna work. The other thing that might occur to you is, well, I could grab my traditional bevel and I could bevel both sides of that line. Well, that's gonna give us kind of a domed puffy look and that's not what we're going for. So that's not gonna work either. The other option, and the one that I think is uh, probably the closest to being the right option would be a modeling spoon. Now we've got another, we've got another tool that I'm gonna tell you about, but the modeling spoon, you could use it to essentially knock off the corners of those cuts and flatten them out a little bit. That's gonna be the best of those three options. So if you don't have this tool that I'm gonna show you, use the modeling spoon. That would be the direction I would have you go. Um, but thankfully there's another option. We can bevel both sides of the line at the same time and it's gonna give us that gradual effect that we want on each of the stripes. And it opens up that cut so they'll hold the antique better. And the stamp is called a double bevel. It's also called like a figure carving stamp or something like that. I'm not sure what Weaver's got it listed at. I'll put a graphic on the screen that tells you what it's listed as on the Weaver website. But generically, it's called a double bevel. And it's because it bevels both sides of the line at the same time and thankfully it also widens that cut just a little bit which means it holds antique better so here's what it looks like very easy to use we're just going to drop it down in the center of the split and then gently walk it just like any other bevel couple of tips for you. Rock it up on its narrow end when you get to the end of the line if in this project. You don't want to do it every project, but in this one, if you'll rock it up on its toe and then give it a gentle tap, it'll finish that line off really nice. The other thing is as you're walking it down the line, the narrow end goes first. I like to lift that leading edge just a little bit. Think of like a speedboat going across the water. Well, the bow of the boat's gonna lift and the rest of the boat's actually what's gonna ride in the water. Same thing here, just don't go too crazy. It's just a tiny bit of lift, that's all you need. So next are the stars, and I can hear some of you out there already thinking, well, why can't we just do it with a stamp? And the truth is, if you have a three quarter inch star stamp, it will probably work for this. Just make sure it's not like a, you know, starfish or something like that. As long as it's a regular star, it'll probably work. But here's the thing, that while it works, doesn't advance our swivel knife skills. So I'm gonna cut mine in with a swivel knife and I would encourage you to at least try the same thing. Maybe do it on some scrap paper before you, or not paper, scrap leather before you actually try it on your project. But this is a good way to advance your skills because it's low risk, but at the same time, it's some tight, short cuts. And uh, I would encourage you to try it. So one of the things I'll point out, as I'm working through the stars, I'm not working them one at a time. I'm working lines because the stars are all lined up the way they are, you should be able to work in straight lines all the way across the pattern, then just turn your project a little bit and find another set of lines and work those. And before you know it, you've got them all cut in. And remember, the swivel knife cuts do not connect. They should come really close, but they should not connect. We're gonna do that with the bevel. 
So to bevel the stars, I'm gonna be using a large traditional bevel. They fit perfectly in those little uh, uh, swivel knife cuts that we made, and it goes really quick. You can either work in lines or you can work around each individual star, whichever makes um, you know your brain happy. So now that we've got it cut in and beveled, we want to start adding some character to it. And one of the ways we can do that is we can distress the flag inside the border. Now, to do that, what we're going to do is we're going to use this particular stamp. I'll put the number on screen. And we're going to take this all the way across the flag portion of the design. We don't want this to get on the outer border that we have there, but we are going to take the texture right up to the edge of the design. As you work your way across the design, adding the texture to it, really you just need kind of medium pressure when you're, you're tapping with your maul on the stamp. It doesn't take a lot, but you do want to leave an impression that will actually hold a little bit of antique when we get to that stage. So once we've got texture over the entire flag design, we're gonna go back and we're actually gonna do it again. But this time, we're gonna work along the borders of that tooling window and around the blue area, that field of blue where the stars are at. The idea here is that we're trying to add texture where the, the grime and the distress and the texture would naturally collect just with normal use. Now here's the thing, we want to keep the texture on the flag, not on that border that goes around it. So you want to take your, your texture tool all the way up, sometimes you want to rock it up on its end to get a little bit more pressure right there, but we're trying to keep the, the texture within the design. In the areas that you think it would collect the most dirt, that's where you want to go the heaviest with the texture. So I don't know if you noticed or not, cause I didn't notice at this point, but there's something missing from the wallet and that, that's one of our stars. There's a star missing from that field of blue that's right smack in the middle, those three quarter inch stars. Yeah, I missed one when I traced it in. And uh, I didn't realize it until much later in the project, actually until after I started painting. So it'll be fun to see how long it takes me to notice that, hey, there's something missing. So. But yeah, other than that, the tooling's done for this project. Now we can move on to painting. 
So with painting an American flag, of course we're gonna go red, white, and blue. I mean, it's an American flag after all. But what about the border and the interior? Well, I wanted something that had a comfortable feel to it, something that stayed in the earth tone range. So I went with a dark brown. Is black an earth tone? I don't think so. Babe! After you paint the stars white and you paint the stripes white, you want to go in and paint that blue around the stars. The nice thing is we have a nice deep gutter around each one of the stars, which means painting that blue right up to the edge is a lot easier. Now, obviously I could paint the red with a regular paintbrush, but at the same time, I can also paint it with my airbrush. And if I got a reason to get my airbrush out, I'm pretty much going to. Here's my airbrush tip for you. The tighter of an area that you're working in, the less paint that you need coming out the end of the airbrush and the closer you need to be to the canvas. This is gonna help make sure that the paint goes where you want it to go and it helps limit the overspray. So that brings up an interesting question that you might be wondering about. Why wouldn't I have painted the red first instead of doing the white, then the red, and letting the overspray get on the white? Well, the reality is that red, if I use my airbrush, is gonna end up in that white stripe, whether it's bare leather, hadn't been painted yet, or whether, I, whether or not I've already painted it white. So by waiting until I've got a couple of layers of white in there, getting the overspray on it, and then putting new white paint over the top of it, well, that's gonna help add to the distressed effect that I'm going for. So if I gotta paint over red anyway, I'd rather use it to my advantage. Then we're good to go ahead and start dyeing the border. And to do this, I'm just gonna grab a paintbrush. It's gonna be the slow way to do it. It's gonna require a couple of coats, but by using a paintbrush, I can cut it in where I want it to go. It gives me the highest level of control instead of like with a dauber where I may or may not end up getting that dye on my paint. We've got it painted, we've got the dye around the outside of the border, now it's time to antique. But if we put antique straight on top of that paint that hasn't been, hasn't been sealed, it's really gonna muddy it up and ruin the look that we've got. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna spray it six, eight times, something like that, with leather sheen. Now the reason I use leather sheen, you've probably heard me say it before, but because you don't have to physically touch it, you run almost zero risk of lifting your paint job off. With something that has to be physically applied with a sponge or a dauber, there's a risk there that you're gonna be lifting that paint off. So aerosol, anytime for me that I'm, I have, I'm sealing something that's got paint on it, I'm going with aerosol. Leather Sheen has a waxy base to it, so it has some moisture repellent aspect to it. It's not truly water repellent, but it helps. So this is gonna give us the protection we need so that we can antique it in the next step. So on this particular project, I want the antique to very lightly tint the paint. If you don't want that, you can always go over it with tan coat 
after you've used the leather sheen. It's really important to use the leather sheen so it locks that color in. But if you don't want it to color it at all, just put some tan coat on top of the leather sheen and it should protect your colors. Once I've got the antique all over the project, I'm pretty much gonna wipe it off immediately. I I'm gonna let it sit there for a couple of minutes, but for the most part, I'm gonna wipe it off immediately. Once I've done that, I'm gonna go back and start working that antique into the areas that I want to look the dirtiest. And this is just simply the areas where I think dirt would collect. It's probably gonna be the corners, the seams, maybe even around the stars, something like that. Definitely around that field of blue where we added the extra texture. That's all gonna be areas where you wanna focus with the antique on the second pass. When I take the antique off this time, I'm not gonna wipe at it. I want a majority of this antique to stay there. So what I'm gonna do is I'm, I'm gonna take a paper towel, I'm gonna bunch it up so I get this kind of ragged end to the end of it, and then I'm just gonna blot at the antique. And sometimes it takes a fair amount of pressure to blot at it and get it to come off, but I don't wanna rub at it because that's gonna take way too much off. So I'm gonna switch over to Black Antique. I want some color variation in there in this distressing that we're doing. So I'm gonna switch over to Black and I'm gonna be applying it in the areas that I want it to look the dirtiest. So you might have a wrinkle or something going across the, the design, definitely in the corners, maybe around that field of blue a little bit. But again, we're gonna put it in the small areas where we want it to look the dirtiest. And then we're gonna go back with that blotting technique again to lift off the antique. If you're enjoying the video, do me a favor, click that like button. It tells me, tells YouTube, tells Weaver that we're on the right track. So now we can jump back in. Once we've got the color the way we like it, we can set that aside and let that antique start to set up and dry. Then we'll want to put another coat of leather sheen on it just to lock it in nice and tight. But for now, we can start working on the assembly portion of it. And we're gonna start with that card pocket because it's a little different. There's no tea pockets, but you know, that's a nice thing because you know, no skiving. Now I've already cut out the main pieces here, but I did want to show you how to cut these slots. All you need for that is a small awl, a small punch, and a craft knife. You can use the awl to mark the holes, the craft knife to cut the slots, then use your punch to cap those holes. That'll keep them from ripping. Now we can flip the leather over, and this is where that square is going to come into play, the one that we didn't want to cut out. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna start by lining up the top right corner of that little square with the bottom slot and the hole that we punched. Then we're gonna mark the bottom of the box with a pencil or a pen. 
From there, you can shift it up, realign it, and mark it again. And just keep doing that till, they all, till you mark all of them. After that, we're gonna dye everything that same dark brown. Now, when I say everything, I mean the interior pieces. I dip dyed everything but that card slot. And the reason I didn't dip dye that is I just finished putting those lines on there. And if I dip dye it, I'll pretty much obliterate those and that will have been for nothing. So I hand dyed that with a dauber. Everything else got dip dyed. So if you need more information on how to dip dye something, Chuck's done a couple of videos that show how to do it, but it's really simple. Essentially what you're gonna do is you're gonna take your piece of leather and you're gonna run it through the dye so that it's submerged for roughly a second, something like that. Let the excess drip off, set it aside, let it dry, and then buff it, because sometimes it get a little bit of a metal uh, shine to it, but if you buff it, that'll come right off. So now it's time to add the pockets for those cards. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna start by adding tape to the underside of each one of those slots that we cut. Then we're gonna drop to the bottom line and we're gonna put a piece of double-sided tape on the top of that line. So the slots, the tape goes under the cut. On the lines, the tape goes just barely above the line. So here's how we're gonna do this. We're gonna start with the bottom slot we're gonna remove the backing tape and stick the tie back down. Make sure that it's as straight as it can be because if it's crooked now, it's gonna be really crooked later. Then we're gonna remove the backing on the tape at the bottom and stick the tie back down to it. Fold it over, crease it really good, then move back up to the next piece of tape and repeat the whole process. The problem is that right now there's no bottom piece of tape. We don't have one there right now. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna add another piece of double-sided tape on top of the Tyvek in line with that next line that we drew. And that's where we're gonna stick the Tyvek this time. We're gonna repeat the process until we're done.
And when you are done, it should look something like this. So that's the first big hurdle when it comes to assembly. Now we can start putting the pockets together. We're gonna to take the card slot and put double-sided tape around the border. And actually, I didn't have to go all the way around it. Halfway around would have worked just fine. Then you're gonna line up the corners, press it flat, make sure it adheres really good. Now it's time to start gluing, and that means that we're down to the last few steps, so we're, we can see the finish line from here. I'm gonna start with the main part of the wallet and the liner that we're gonna glue to that. And with all of the pieces that we're gluing, we're gonna be putting on two coats of contact cement. And the reason we wanna do that, a lot of times that first coat really just soaks into the leather, it primes the leather, but there's no real stickiness to it. So it's the second coat that really stays on top and that's where we get our tackiness from. So two coats if it's meant to be a permanent bond. You always wanna work from the center out, never from the outside in. Next, I added two coats of glue to that pocket. We're gonna be folding it in half and stitching it, but the glue will make it feel like a single layer of leather instead of two. It's also gonna make it look a lot more professional with that folded edge. When you get to the edge, Either pick it up like you see me doing here or let it hang off the edge of your work surface. That's gonna give you the best chance at not having any glue wrap around to the front of your project. Once it's no longer wet, it should be tacky, which means it's time to put it together. But you need to be really confident in your movement. So take your time, line it up correctly, and when you decide to put it together, do it slowly and confidently. Now, one thing I'll point out, as I was putting it down, I noticed that the corners weren't gonna have any glue under them on the liner piece. So instead of going ahead and sticking it down and trying to fix it later, added some more glue to it, waited for it to get tacky, and then I stuck it down. Once you're confident that it's glued down, it's not going anywhere, it's time to cut off the excess. So it's time to start stitching. And while I'm gonna show you where to punch your stitch holes, I'm not gonna spend very much time on the actual stitching itself. Chuck did a really good video on how to saddle stitch, which is what we're doing here. So we'll make sure that there's a link in the description so you can go watch that. That way we can keep the video to a, a watchable length. With that, it's time to glue again, but this time we're gonna be using leather weld. It's not a permanent bond. It's great for tacking something in place while you sew it. The nice thing is you can move it around after you put it together. With contact cement, it's one shot and you're done. With leather weld, it's a little bit more like Elmer's glue. You can move it around before the glue sets.
Now, I'm not really a fan of hard corners and leather work. They tend to be a high friction area. They take a lot of damage. So I'm gonna take my corner knives and round these edges off. We can rebevel those corners that we just rounded off and we're ready to mark our stitch line. So I'm going to be going with a 3 16 inch stitch line. One simple reason. I didn't want my stitch line to overlap with the Tyvek pockets that we just finished putting in. So 3 16 was the measurement that worked. As you start to punch the holes for your stitches, make sure that your chisel is straight up and down. Leaning it side to side is really going to throw off your stitches on the inside of the wallet. Once it's time to start stitching, I'm going to start in an area that's going to allow me to hide the stitch between two layers of leather. And I want it to be kind of an inconspicuous spot on the wallet. For thread, I went seven times the distance that I have to stitch. Normally you would go four, but each end of this wallet's got a little bit of thickness to it. So I went with seven and I had more than enough. You could probably get away with six, but I went with seven. and we can slick the edges. One thing that I'll mention real quick is that I did not use an edge bevel on that liner piece, and that's because it's too thin for the bevels that I have. So instead of doing that, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use my slicker and burnish the edge of it down really well. That way I don't run a, the chance of you know damaging the leather, but I still get the edge that I'm looking for. When you fold the wallet over for the first time, one of the things that I'll do with something like this that has a little bit of resistance to it is I'm gonna moisten the inside of the wallet. Now, I don't want that moisture to get outside on the paint, so I'm just gonna moisten the inside of it very lightly, let the water soak into the leather. That moisture is gonna allow the leather to stretch and bend easier. The big key, though, is just to go slow because if you go too fast and you try to force it, you might end up cracking it. So once you got a good bend going and you got it started, all you need to do is just put your granite block on top of it and let it sit. 
that's going to do it for this video. I will see you in the next one. In the meantime, go make something amazing. <laughs>